this time. Got it. All right, so welcome everyone. I'm uh, Christina Montanez. I'm a professor in the counseling program, both undergraduate and graduate at National University. I'm also an active member of IHPC, um, so really committed to advocacy around this area as well. Um, and I'm really excited to be with you here today. So my background is a pastoral counselor. That's what the CPC stands for, Certified Pastoral Counselor. And on the interdisciplinary team in hospice land, as we say, hospice and palliative care land, I occupy the position of spiritual care or chaplaincy. So I've been doing that for about eight and a half years, almost 10, I can't believe, I can't imagine advocacy as well. And prior to that worked in um, settings where we were serving survivors of politically motivated torture and forced migration. And so I had a really um, keen understanding of not just individual bereavement, but cultural bereavement as well. And so I hope to weave some of that into our time together today. So that's my brief intro. If we could just move on to slides. We have a short amount of time today, um, but these are the learning objectives for the whole module. And I've just highlighted where I'm gonna spend some time because of the short time that we have. You will have the full slide deck available to you, but I wanna make sure that we're covering uh, in particular trauma-informed care because we are talking about working in low resource settings, and also um, a lot of complicated bereavement comes around this area as well. Uh, we'll learn about the stepwise approach to trauma-informed care. We'll also talk uh, about psychosocial and spiritual care, and I'll emphasize a, a, a particular model for uh, spiritual assessment, especially if you don't have access to spiritual care or chaplains. And we'll end with a discussion of bereavement, but also the, the through line from uh, Professor Harriet's presentation last week will be the idea of self-care for us and how do we sit with suffering in this work. So next slide. That's what we'll be doing today. All right. So first things first, we'll want to give a good definition of trauma here. So we practice from a trauma-informed approach. And really, I'm just going to give you a, a, a brief definition of that, but it really is individual trauma resulting from an event, series of events, or set of circumstances that's experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening. And it has lasting and adverse effects on the individual's functioning. Oh, for some reason, the slides are skipping. Thank you. Um, and also their mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being. And I'm actually going to connect this idea a little bit down the road to what we call moral injury or soul injury, because they often go hand in hand um, when we're looking at these uh, concepts. So ready for next slide, everyone? Thank you. So what we mean by trauma-informed care is an approach in our human services profession or field that assumes that an individual is more likely than not to have a history of trauma. And trauma-informed care recognizes that presence of trauma, symptoms, it also acknowledges the role that trauma might play in an individual's life, including service staff. So think of yourselves too. Remember, we're, we're um, mindful of that, especially any counter-transference that might come up as we're working with patients. All right, thank you, next slide. So it's also an understanding of uh, patients' life experiences in their full totality in order to, live, to deliver effective care. And so you see this image here of so many people gathering around this patient. We have our social worker or our clinician uh, right here in the corner, other people on looking. And so you know that understanding a patient and the context in which they're living in their environment is really important as well. It also has the potential to improve patient engagement when we work from a trauma-informed lens, treatment adherence, and health outcomes. All right, thank you. Next slide. So some of the challenges that we run into in the palliative care context, we all know time, 
time is of the essence. And so traditional treatments to treat trauma um, may need access to uh, mental health providers, a full multidisciplinary team, Sometimes in um, people who work with trauma, especially severe trauma that might inv involve physical violence of any kind, you may work with a team that is uh, inclusive of many different professionals, including neurologists. Uh, therapy sessions tend to be 50 minutes, sometimes 90 for severe trauma. Um, I first came to this work working with survivors of torture and cultural bereavement processes, um, helping facilitate those when... Um, uh, when I first started as a pastoral counselor, and there's quite a bit of wraparound, what we call wraparound services. Now, again, in the context of your, your work in Lesotho, it's very difficult to access these things. So I'm giving you a picture of how challenging it could be in um, throughout all, many settings, but this is the typical uh, process. It includes treatment with uh, cognitive behavioral therapies, perhaps EMDR, um, certainly bringing in pastoral counselors like myself, because many people who suffer trauma do either respond to or have some type of um, relationship with their faith. Sometimes it's a negative one, but more, more often than not, it's a positive one. And so pastoral counselors can really help navigate those waters. Um, next slide, please. And also for palliative care and trauma-informed care, we have some information here from Feldman. Um, you know, illness can serve as the primary traumatic event, and that sometimes happens. And so that idea that bereavement and complex social psychosocial assessment, it starts when we receive a diagnosis is very important. Um, you may encounter people who have past trauma due to war, genocide, forced migration, natural disaster, so many things can impact. Um, and those memories can become reactivated at the end of life. And we see that often. And that's where I'll connect down the road with this idea of moral or soul injury and what we can do from the spiritual care and psychosocial support perspective there. Next slide, please. Okay, so where do we start? We come from this perspective with the knowledge that we have now and that we're learning. We recognize trauma and we see it as distressing memories, maybe intrusive thoughts, avoidance, difficulty sleeping, uh, nightmares. We then listen, sit down and express empathy. I can imagine how difficult this must be. I can't imagine how scary this must be for you. So we wanna really come from a posture of empathy and uh, unconditional positive regard. Is there anything that I can do in this environment to make you feel safer? Or can I assist you with future appointments? These types of questions indicate to the patient and family members that you understand that there's more going on here and that you're a safe space to be able to work through these types of um, issues that may come up. All right, next slide, please. What a beautiful image there. So serious illness and PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder um, in your ICD and DC, D, uh, DSMs as well. We use DSM quite a bit here in the States. Um, really what in these uh, settings, receiving that diagnosis of a life-limiting illness and experiencing related systems such as pain, air hunger, that can elicit a lot of feelings of vulnerability and helplessness. And that may an index trauma or a trigger of PTSD reminding one of the index trauma, so that initial trauma. So that initial feeling of, I'm not in control. I'm not in control of my body. I can't help my loved ones. That in and of itself is enough to trigger these feelings. So coping with PTSD or trauma may be, um, people cope with avoidance strategies. Could be, you know, maybe remaining physically or mentally occupied, misusing substances, emotional numbing, uh, anger sometimes. That could be some type of coping strategy. These coping strategies can be healthy or not. So that's really important to remember that uh, even if it's a negative behavior, it may still be a way of coping. So, uh, Medical decision making becomes really important here and the anxiety that goes around with making those decisions 
and accompanying PTSD can really lead patients to kind of perseverate on treatment options. And I find this to be really important when I'm working with people at the bedside and I see them ruminating or perseverating on something, it is a red flag to me that I should be looking in a different direction, that maybe it's not just a physical symptom, but there's something that is kind of really keeping them attached to this idea. And so having team members like spiritual care providers or trauma-informed nursing staff or healthcare workers, whomever you have as part of that team and have access, understand that that may be an indication that a little more conversation may need to take place around that. That's really important. Also functional decline. When we're physically declining, that's a trigger. I know even in myself, if I'm feeling ill or sick, it's very difficult for me to deal with the things that I need to do in my own life. And then imagine that when you're in a, a situation where you're actually um, dying and nearing end of life. Uh, medications and medical effects um, can have properties, for instance, our pain medications um, tend to dull the reflexes. And that is another way where we are triggered and sometimes with um, trauma-informed care to understand that that is a release of control and a patient may feel very disoriented and vulnerable in that setting. And then pain itself, it's really a bi-directional relationship with pain where pain influences PTSD symptoms and vice versa. And so an example might be someone in physical pain um, precipitating intrusive memories that they have all of a sudden or changes in their dream life uh, that could amplify the pain experience. Uh, some other things when people are steeping in really deep regrets uh, that's okay for you to move on to that. Thank you. Um, that can be a really big challenge too, and maybe worth exploration. So what do we do about it? We have this beautiful model here that we're presenting from David Feldman called the Stepwise Social, so, so, Psychosocial Palliative Care Model, and it's three steps. We can move on to the next one. Thank you. Um, the first is to palliate. We want to think of that total pain model, and we have a slide down the road with that as well, but we want to take an idea that any type of pain, physical, psychosocial, emotional, um, spiritual, is a type of pain that we want to try and, and palliate. So developing a trusting relationship with active and reflective listening is important, expressing unconditional positive regard with empathy, curiosity, um, I love the idea of humble inquiry, humble inquiry. Tell me a little bit more about that. What is her greatest concern? Yes, absolutely, Esther. These are wonderful phrases to be able to um, uh, get at what, what it is that is the pressing concern for the patient or family at that time. Um, changes to the physical environment are also important to note. We can move on to the next slide, please. All right. So the first, uh, that's the first step. step. Stage two then is providing psychoeducation and enhancing coping skills. So we want to do a lot. I think all of us are clinical educators, right? We, we learned that in school and you're, you're learning that here now. And so getting a chance to really tune into ways that we can teach our patients, whether that's the teach back method. So I'm teaching you something, we'll practice it together. You practice, we'll come keep refining that. That could be something like relaxation techniques and breathing exercises. Um, that may be difficult for somebody who is on the CP COPD spectrum or having any type of lung issues. So maybe relaxing or, um, or uh, gentle touch could be something, but these are things to communicate with the patient and family members and also to demonstrate to the caregivers as well because we want to make sure we're not there 24 seven, but the carers are. And so we want to make sure to teach those skills as well. All right, moving on to the next slide. And then teaching the actual or treating the actual specific trauma issues. So if that does not work, stage one, stage two, uh, one should proceed to this area. And that's really only when earlier in interventions haven't really worked. Um, and or a prognosis and energy levels limit uh, the permit of use of longer term strategies such as these. So one of the things that is important is to get that case consulting, uh, consulting process underway. Um, and if you can find people within your scope or within your um, network that have trauma specific 
um, expertise, please reach out to them and connect. But what do we do is really employ trauma-focused psychotherapeutic methods with um, mental health professionals typically in this type of setting. So moving on to the next slide. This um, slide is wonderful. It just gives us a visual example of really what we've learned so far. So pain and symptom control plus psychological, social, and spiritual support so support really are that palliative care model for the patient and the family. And you've heard me say patient and family quite a bit throughout this. I interact with family members very often. And the settings that I've worked in, sometimes our patients are nonverbal and unable to uh, or express themselves or the disease has progressed so much that we're doing more um, you know, spiritual work with them and less talking. So we're speaking more and, and, and talking more with the family. Um, next slide, slide, please. So that's why we emphasize here both patient and family or caregivers. I like this slide here, and I'm glad that we um, had a chance. I kept it into the slide deck that we're seeing here. There's a distinction between a comprehensive psychosocial assessment and a social history. And uh, this may not necessarily be applicable to Lesotho's context, but it could be. And so we set, we tend to, I know in our experience of Malawi, when we first were going out in the field and introducing psychosocial assessment, it was kind of a tick box here of what is the past, what is the history. And so our team has worked tremendously hard to really make it a comprehensive psychosocial assessment, evaluating what the sources of meaning are, the cultural um, uh uh, items that they need to be aware of to incorporate and to respond uh, to the total pain or total suffering experience of our, our patients when we're in the field. Um, and that it, it can be challenging and it does happen over the course of time, but really important to have, yes, uh, Joan, good psychosocial and spiritual assessment to explore, to explore things. All right, moving on to the next uh, slide here. Thank you. So what is needed for a psychosocial assessment? Um, little is known about palliative care and hospice assessments. And this is true. I teach this uh, in courses here in the States. And there's thankfully a growing body of knowledge that came out of COVID response. So the, the literature is, um, is picking up a little bit in response for that. But what we found was most psychosocial assessments and even electronic medical record systems that we use in uh, different settings, they don't have these built in. So it really is up to us as clinicians to take what we're learning here and to look at our assessments and to really um, identify areas where we can give a good comprehensive psychosocial assessment, including making up a form that works for our setting, okay? Um, so they didn't include things like patient and functional status or preferences for treatment and care, um, awareness, patients' awareness of what their diagnosis meant um, and teaching associated with that. Uh, they found that prognosis and disease progression was missing from these assessments, and then both cultural values and communication and health literacy. So we learned that we need to incorporate these things. And you can move to the next slide, please. Um, so when you're thinking about your settings and uh, what we want to do is make sure that those items are included in psychosocial assessment. And I'm sure this team here can share some forms if, if that's, if that's uh, needed or indicated. But I encourage you to develop them with your care teams in your own settings as well. So a quick uh, note about uh, dignity therapy. I use this quite a bit. I use the PDQ, but also I use the PDQ inventory as well. And um, this is really asking one simple question here, and I've bolded that here. What do I need to know about you as a person to give you the best care possible? Now, you may need to translate that uh, for yourselves in different settings, but the gist of it is, is tell me what I need to know about the essence of who you are as a human being so that I can speak to that, that I can care for you at your core because it's important to do so, especially as somebody is at end of life. And that could lead to a conversation about what brings a person joy. Tell me yourself, tell me about yourself as a person. We can move on to the next one. And this simple question can be very powerful and effective 
for really addressing this idea of total suffering that our uh, dear friend Tabello has uh, been reminding us that's why we're here, right? That's why we're learning. And so it gets to so many of these quadrants on this model. Um, we're going to shift and talk a little bit about spiritual and emotional here in a second, but I just wanted to make sure to include this to remind us that this is our picture of total suffering. All right, next slide, please. Okay, I'm actually going to come back to sitting with suffering. So if we could flip through the next two slides, I'll end here. Um, the next one. All right, perfect. So psychological distress, um, some simple questions for a psychosocial assessment uh, could be what helps you cope? What are you hoping for? So many people are afraid to ask dying people what their hopes are. And that's really, um, I think we shy away from that. And so bringing that back in, what are your hopes? It can lead to a conversation about legacy leaving, building on to, uh, you know, I hope for my family to be cared for. I hope for my family to, you know, it leads to conversations like that. How are your spirits or your mood today? And I really, really want to emphasize today because it changes or right now, it changes from time to time. As we know, working with people at end of life, things can change very quickly. Um, or what brings you joy? Are there things that bring you joy and what helps you cope? Sorry, that's redundant there. I didn't catch that. Uh, so next slide. These are just simple questions that any clinician can use as well. So how do we then support? Um, we offer a non-judgmental emotional support presence. We do not shy away from the emotional tones. And we validate with terms like, it's common to feel this way, or I can't imagine how difficult this must be for you. When you say that and mindful of your tone of voice, you see, I just kind of took that down a few notches and reflect that back softly. Our energy as clinicians is really important. If we're going from place to place and rush to rush, or we've just gone all the way out into to the field and it was a difficult journey, I really encourage you to just take a minute of mindfulness, breathe, pray if you pray, uh, do a mindful intention to center yourself so that when you walk into the home, you can calmly say and assess with these types of tones, it's common to feel this way. I hear what you're saying. You know, what can I do for you today? Also managing physical symptoms um, is really an emo a part. Often people can't get to emotional processes when they're in physical pain. So making sure that we all ask, no matter what discipline and the way that we practice both in Malawi and here in the States, our team, every single one of us is asking about physical pain. And then we coordinate with one another if that's outside of our discipline to be able to manage, but we're at least assessing for that. And then encouraging. So much of what we do is being what we call hope lenders. When someone doesn't have hope, well, that's why I'm here. I'm going to lend you a little bit of mine today. And let's, let's do this together. Um, social support. Unit of care is usually the family. We know that. Um, and we've, I've learned so much during this course as well. This is true in Lesotho as well. We do know also that this can impact families. Sometimes people are diagnosed with an illness and the family leaves or separates or moves on. And so that's something that we deal with quite a bit in Malawi. And so learning and understanding that the unit of family is also sometimes the greater community around that person. Or if it's something where many people feel ostracized, which is the case in cervical cancer in many cases in Malawi, then we find other part family um, to be able to help support. And sometimes that's you as the clinician and your group of interdisciplinary providers. Um, impact of illness on finances, income generation, all of these things are stressors. So we need to assess for those. And then also, I love this question. Family members need, we need to assess how is it that they like to receive information? Um, this is really important. Um, some people like to have, you know, graphics left with them if that's possible. Other people need to hear it multiple times, some in different languages. So making sure we assess uh, preferred methods of communication is important. And then we'll talk about um, emotional and spiritual practical support. We've done quite a bit. So I'll move on to the next uh, slide, please. 
All right, a bit about depression and anxiety. We've talked about it a little bit um, and introduced it in the context of um, total pain as well. Depression and anxiety often accompany um, a, a life-limiting illness diagnosis or a serious illness diagnosis. And so it's worth mentioning here what those indicators are. So low mood, um, loss of interest in uh, daily activities, really anhedonia, feelings of hopelessness, worthlessness, guilt, or su suicidal ideation. It's important that we note and try to assess if somebody was feeling suicidal prior to that, or if this is within the context of their um, getting their di diagnosis because it's a slightly different uh, uh, way of treating it from um, the psychosocial perspective. Uh, and then there's different, uh, if we could go back to that last slide, there's different indicators about medications there. And then also anxiety, anxiety lives in our body. So one of the things that I really do like, and I appreciate that it's on this slide here is the progressive muscle relaxation. So um, moving on to the next um slide. Christina, sorry, it's Esther. Um, do you think you can finish your presentation in about five minutes? Yes, I do. Yeah. Okay. Great. So I'm going to let everybody just um, look at the, the slides when you see them about de depression and the relationship with demoralization, and we'll kick to the next couple slides here and end in that other one. So you could go on to spiritual distress. Okay. Um, next one. Or I'm sorry, previous one. Spiritual distress, this, this is my area where I work quite a bit. Um, and I wanted to bring up the idea of moral injury here as well. So spiritual well-being can be understood as a feeling of peace or contentment. And when people, particularly those who have experienced trauma, um, depending on the setting and the type of trauma, um, they often experience something that might be considered moral injury. Perhaps there's something that they did or didn't do. There's feelings of guilt that are resonating um, or soul injury. There's something that is so affronting to their sense of dignity. Perhaps somebody has experienced sexualized violence um, or uh, a death or witnessed a death that's, and couldn't do anything about it. Those are the types of things that stick to the soul. And so they can often be um, result in what we call spiritual pain or spiritual distress. And that can really devastate and, and challenge these things that keep many people going like meaning and hope and give a sense of existential anxiety on top of a terminal illness. We can move to the next slide. So ways that we can assess for that are this hope model. And a hope assessment is we ask about their sources of hope, meaning and comfort, we ask if they're part of an organized religion um, or cultural traditional practice, if they have any spiritual practices which help them and give them comfort. So praying, reading the Bible, reading the Quran, reading many holy books, whatever is important to them um, could be one or being in community such as a mass or a community, um, community worship. Uh, and we ask about that effects on medical care and treatment. So that's your hope model there. And when we do the discussion, we'll ask you to use this model um, to think in case conceptualize. All right, next slide. slide. Um, we wanna make sure that we listen. Listening, I think a lot of people ask me, what do I do uh, when I'm at bedside? Uh, compassionate presence is so powerful. Listening reflective listening, making sure that you're um, asking questions like, tell me more about that, or I'm not familiar with that. Tell me what that feels like for you. Or how do you know when you feel better in the past? You know, are there things and ways that we can connect to? We want to make sure that we're not skirting around or giving a false sense of reassurance, especially in the spiritual interactions that we have. And then we want to make sure that we're offering a sense of meaning. So if prayer is important to somebody, I'll ask, may I pray with you today? May I read to you today? Maybe we can do something together to connect their spiritual or religious leader so they can have more consistent care because I, as a clinician, am only visiting maybe once a month, once or twice a month. 
maybe more towards the end of life. All right, next one. Uh, we want to make sure that we're talking about grief before it happens. So that pre-bereavement process, because people can experience grief themselves, anticipatory grief, as we've heard before. And really, it doesn't go in a straight line. It's not. So the next couple of images, you can move to the next slide, Tabella, thank you, are really helpful for understanding grief, that it's not this perfectly linear or circular process. Um, oh, sorry, go back. Um, and that it's really can be complicated. It can look really messy. So these are important uh, aspects here. All right, and to close, I would like if we could go back to, and I'm sorry, these are not in the order, to this idea of um, sitting with suffering, please. And it should be a few slides back. And um, it, I wanna connect, thank you. I wanna connect this idea with Ratner and Berzoff, their work, with what we were talking about with uh, Dr. Harriet's um, presentation last week, this idea that it's very difficult for those of us in palliative care and hospice to sit with this. We want to fix. It's human nature to be able to want to alleviate or fix suffering. And so we need to kind of shift our paradigm to think about what is possible to do? How can I palliate within the scope of my practice and then the idea that we must just sit with suffering sometimes. It's part of what we do. And sometimes being able to connect to that suffering, um, invite it in, reflect on it, and move on through that process that Harriet discussed last week is very important. We will not, uh, suffering goes hand in hand with receiving a, a life limiting or serious illness diagnosis. And so we won't be able to eliminate that, but what we can do is to best understand how we can approach it from a trauma informed lens, to approach it from a dignity lens, and also attend to the total well being of the patient. When we've done that, we sit with it, we reflect on it, and we move forward. Thanks, right. Christina. Thank you. Um, so we're going to have 20 minutes to discuss the questions that you um, that you gave us. I will post those questions in the chat. Oh, great. Okay. Um, and then if you want to read in the chat, someone has actually described a situation of um, a person who was trafficked, who has a recent diagnosis of cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. So if you want to just read back in the chat, maybe Joan already gave some good um, some good input, but if you want to respond to that as well. Yes, I'll um, do that while we're putting up the questions and I thank so you. So the first, me. yeah, so the first question, I don't know, somebody um, was gonna put them on slides, so I'm not quite sure um, if somebody has that to share, but while we're waiting, I will ask the first question. Um, so what is your experience of providing trauma-informed care within the setting in which you work in Lesotho. So if people could either put up their hand or answer in the chat, has anybody had an experience with trauma-informed care in Lesotho? That's one of our discussions. Yeah, so Joan has also talked about our sexuality um, I'm wondering, um, so my, most of my experience is working as a palliative care nurse in Canada. Um, one of the things that I find um, my patients saying is one of their most um, traumatic experience was with the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. And I find a lot of patients, it's actually going to the hospital and the whole thing that has that. Okay. Oh, great. And I'm just looking, I'm getting caught up on the chat here. Okay. So I'm actually going to put it here on my other screen. This is a, an, an important case. Yes. So in, in my experience with um, survivors of torture, including human trafficking, um, 
I, I see what Joan and Esther have said here um, and with the, with the cancer diagnosis as well. Um, really important to attune and use that thorough psychosocial assessment set of questions that we've, we've reviewed here if you haven't already done so. This is probably the most um, sexualized violence and sexualized violence um, at the at the hands of or the um, prompting of a, a, a trusted loved one, there are multiple violations of trust here. So the fact that this client has shared it with you is huge. So being able to create some space to talk as little or as or as not as they want is important. Um, and this would be somebody that I would increase my visit frequency to see and also make sure that if we have access to psychosocial support that you get that in place right away. I will say that um, it would be a case too where you would wanna manage your own countertransference and emotions that come up for you as a clinician because uh, this is really difficult. And now this client is living with the trauma physically in her body in places where um, should be private and, and sacred, right? Mm -hmm. And they've been violated. And so making sure that you open up that conversation and show gratitude and appreciation for their trust in you is a very important process. And it may take lots of listening and outpouring of those emotions, especially if the client does not have that space in their own family. Um, to work through that anger. I would be careful in trying to do a full family scale intervention. We actually has had a couple of these uh, situations in Malawi before where the approach was to try to um, fix the family and reconciliation. That's not necessarily indicated here. Mm -hmm. What we would do is sit with this patient mm -hmm. and listen and develop some type of ritual or healing experience um, sometimes if with permission, the patient will allow you to just place your hand on their heart and give you, you know, receive healing love through you. That can be something that's very powerful. Um, but I would, I would definitely hope that you could get some type of counselor or psychosocial support in there. And it seems like you already say that she uh, is a believer and goes to church every Sunday with her mother. If her mother is a source of comfort and she's sharing that, then that's important to give that support to the mother as well. Um, but if she's disclosed it, disclosed it with you in private, then um, really just spending that time opening up and introducing the relationship to a social worker or social care provider is important. Does anybody else have some comments on, on that case? Thank you for bringing it. It's a very important case. Yes, I just, um, I was just looking at it um as well and thinking about um, uh, what you've been talking about in terms of the, the, the psychological aspect or the psych psychological element of this. There is a lot of trauma mm -hmm. that has gone on for this person, but there is also a trauma that's going on right now, which is right. the, 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 the cancer itself that, that, is, mm -hmm. that is going on right now. Mm -hmm. So there is almost a need to help this person to reconcile all these traumas mm -hmm. and then find a way of managing or almost sitting in the in the suffering because they need to sit in that in mm -hmm. order for them to actually move uh, uh, forward mm -hmm. in what mm -hmm. they need to sometimes uh when there is another trauma already happening may not be a very good place to be dealing with the previous trauma mm -hmm. because that can be very difficult to do when you are already suffering mm -hmm. or when in a difficult thing but there is a um recovery model that i was just thinking about when you were speaking which mm -hmm. uh, is called wellness and recovery action planning yes it talks about kind of like just putting your life your situation your your place into perspective where you can have hope at the top of that mm -hmm. but then think about what education what do you need this person to know in order for them to self-advocate, to be able to manage what is going on for themselves. So there is uh, five things which I'll put in the chat, which is to uh, uh, help them to establish or, uh, or have hope. 
to educate them around what is needed for them in this moment, to think about a way for them to have self-advocacy, so to be able to speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. All these things have happened to them, but there is still stuff that they are in control of. Mm -hmm. so them to, to test the things they can control. And then finally, what is the support? What kind of support have they got around them mm -hmm. to be able to do all of that thing? Mm -hmm. So you might not even need to, to talk about the traumas themselves, mm -hmm. but allow the person to talk about them in a way that brings mm -hmm. them to a place of, uh, mm -hmm. uh, of being able to hold it. I love that. I think it's really driven by the question too about the Esther that you, you mentioned is it is this something she feels she needs to talk about? And if it's not, it's simply disclosing it, then that, that's fine. Knowing that she's disclosed that, we don't need to open that up if it's not necessary. Mm -hmm. Now, in times where um, we have what is called compounded trauma, right? They're overlapping, they're on top of each other, and there's many things. I love this model. Thank you, uh, Harriet, for sharing it with us because it can give us kind of, um, it's almost solution focused right here in the here and now. And um, that's important as well. For those patients though, that do need that healing or want to have some sort of um, uh, healing work done around that, bringing in your um, psychosocial, support, psychosocial support team can be helpful. All right, thank you. Any other, are, are other uh, team members or professors? That well, was maybe we should, I think we should maybe move to the second question, okay. if, if you're okay with that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the second question is about the HOPE model of spiritual assessment that you just um, mm -hmm. went over with us. So the question for the participants is, do you work with or have access to chaplains or spiritual care providers in your setting? Um, does anybody have examples of how they work, um, how a spiritual, if, do they have a chaplain or their pastors that are part of their team? This one, I think, um, Esther, um, uh, I can say something while the, um, our colleagues and uh, participants are trying to see if they can answer. But um, in Lesotho, the practice, um, in fact, our health and uh, social care setting, it's one that I think uh, we need. Um, we needed um, sessions like this uh, just to really sensitize uh, us as healthcare and social practitioners to really appreciate the element of uh, the spiritual domain within the care that uh, we deliver. Uh, for our service users, as well as uh, amongst ourselves. So um, the chaplain services, you'll find that uh, they are available in some of uh, the Christian Hospital Association uh, facilities. And um, in the main public um, um, hospitals and clinics, we really don't have that. And that is one of the drive for Starlight uh, Oasis of Hope Hospice when we look at the total care model because of uh, acknowledging how much of that total pain is being experienced by uh, uh, patients and families on a day-to-day basis. And uh, the need for the incorporation of uh, this uh, pastoral care within our healthcare services. So that is an element that is lacking which we need to really have for advocates like uh, the people that we have on this call and hopefully on the next batch as well. So that uh, most of them, they are really high uh, ranking uh, practitioners. So that as, as Starlight is trying to advocate uh, for the change in the total care model perspective, mm -hmm. then we will have for internal advocates that will be acknowledging and appreciating uh, this kind of changes for the benefit of those that we look after, even as um, uh, practitioners ourselves, because there are no wellness uh, facilities or pastoral facilities uh, for anybody to get counseling or support. Should we have issues at home with our spouses, with our children, or even life in general. So I think 
As we we had uh, this uh, wonderful and informative sessions were well, from uh, Professor Christina and contributions uh, from everybody else. Uh, and what has been coming to me is that uh, for us in Lesotho to be compassionate caregivers, we needed to have uh, the very same compassionate presence that has been discussed and uh, that generous listening. But we can't just listen without acting. Then we have to devise and uh, do this restructuring from within the social uh, development, from within Ministry of Health, to see that we incorporate all these disciplines that will help us to deliver the best mm -hmm. quality of care to these people who are already experiencing so much trauma with uh, their cancer diagnosis or any other life-limiting condition, and uh, just to stand with them and support them. And I mm -hmm. think uh, that is uh, where um, I think uh, we lack um, um this area so much so to Bella, we have a wonderful question or comment um in in the chat here and i think this is a good place for us to touch base you know my experience working in africa has been um really really important there's lots of bi-directional learning so i'm learning so much from my malawian colleagues who are global partners all of you here as well and one of the things that we talk about quite often and openly is the idea that many people come from a, a Christian or a Judeo-Christian background when it comes to spiritual care and um, counseling. And in the area where we uh, serve in, in Nkoma, there's a large Mus Muslim population that is in the catchment area nearby who comes and receives services in the Nkoma area. And our chaplains have done a tremendous job of stretching themselves of learning ways to assess psychosocial and spiritual support and bracketing their own beliefs which has been difficult because they are uh, trained chaplains born to evangelize and that is a calling they feel but we opened this discussion together with over years and teaching and also bringing in the idea that spirituality and sources of meaning come from so many different areas and directions. And so coming from this approach I mentioned before of humble inquiry, of learning, tell me what that means for you. I don't know much about that, but I do know that there's an imam. Are you are you uh, connected with your imam in the community? Is that something that I can help with? Can we go and give information about what palliative care is and end of life? And so they've created this beautiful network of sensitization and teaching curriculum where they're going into multiple faith traditions and leaders and teaching about the basics of palliative care and what end of life care is and things that their own faith leaders can do to help support people in their communities and across denominations. They also do that with the traditional healers. We have a very good relationship with, I would say three traditional healers in the area. And that took us going out, building that relationship, seeing how the traditional healers operate their clinics because they call them clinics, right? And to learn about that and understand that and to build the relationship of referral back and forth between the traditional healers and the Nkoma catchment area and the hospital in that area. But this has been a, a long road and it's taken um, more and more of our team going and getting information and learning about, you know, uh, about uh, uh, providing spiritual care and psychosocial care to people who are not in their same denomination. And so I'm really, really glad to, uh, to be able to say that our team has, is doing that. And what ha it has done is it has cre increased, and the chiefs as well, they work a network of ch uh, their chiefs as well, it has increased their palliative care census and people are referring from community to them. So it could be to Bella that what we're talking about is building that network, that if you don't have trained pastoral counselors or chaplains, there are other ways to build a network of referral and support, um, knowing your own communities as well. And I'm sure like Malawi in Lusutu, there's different areas and different pockets of, um, of, uh, of cultural differences. So it's just learning that uh, and coming together as well. Um, Christian Maid helps the situation, uh, health institutions as well. Yeah, that's the similar uh, that we're working in the Christian, the CHAMP uh, system in Malawi as well. Yeah, in, in Senegal, we, um, we included uh, 
training for spiritual leaders, mm-hmm. palliative care training. Yes. So we had at least two days where we invited imams and pastors and different people. So mm-hmm. um, I think it, it just takes, because in some countries, um, if you really want to advocate for palliative care um, and you have the spiritual leaders on your side, it's really going to go places. It often has to Absolutely. sometimes start with, with those people. So it's important for us as healthcare providers to remember the importance of the spiritual care. Mm-hmm. Um, we have one more question um, and then we should start the case study. Wonderful. So the, the third question was about sitting and suffering. How um, we talked about self-care last week and how does that resonate with you, the, the idea of sitting with suffering? Um, one of the discussions that Tabello and, and I had during the week, Christina, is the fact that suffering and the interpretation of what suffering is, is very different in mm-hmm. different cultures. Um, where, especially coming from the West where things are so comfortable, Mm -hmm. we have this great aversion to suffering, but in many countries, suffering is part of life. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's harder for us sometimes to sit in that because we're so used to personal rights and comfort. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm not sure about people on the line. Has anybody had? And do we have uh, the next, I don't think. The I next can. slide maybe with the question on it. I, I'm loving, I'm reading this chat too. So thank you everyone yeah. for con- contributing here. Um, so yeah, sitting with suffering, Christina, that was the question mm-hmm. with um, yes. talking about self-care. Um, what does it mean to sitting with suffering? And like I said, I think mm-hmm. what you consider suffering makes a really big difference. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the people that I worked with believe that suffering is given by God to right. kind of test suffering. your mm-hmm. faith to test your faithfulness. So it's actually not a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I love that point. I'm I'm a, I'm curious to know from those of you in Lesotho what what you're seeing as far as the the purpose of suffering. Because some people refer to that there's a purpose in suffering. Well, I think the Christian faith does that as well. Yeah. And I'm also, yes, I'm also seeing too that um, there's a few comments on the chats about, um, you know, more traditionist or spirit, traditional or spiritist beliefs that the suffering is as, as a result of a curse or some wrongdoing that's happened in life. And so I'm wondering too, let's, this is a learning environment for, for one another. What are some uh, strategies that you use when you're working with people who have this worldview, which is an important thing to uh, understand and consider when you're doing your psychosocial assessment? Go ahead and jump in if you. Yeah, we just have a few minutes after the discussion and then we need to move on to um, to give time for the case presentation. There's any. We can also come back to this question if we have time at the end. Hey? This these these questions are for people to percolate on. We're all reflective practitioners here. So, you know, it's kind of like a counseling session. The learning takes place in between and it keeps going, right? This is just a prompt. So if you are someone who journals or a reflective practitioner, sit with these, think about them yourselves. But Harriet, I know you were ju- going to jump in. I was just going to have to say that, <laughs> that maybe this is actually a reflective mm-hmm. kind of uh, question. And I wonder whether the reflection would really be around what your own perspective uh, perspective of suffering is Mm -hmm. because um, Mm -hmm. if all these different perspectives that you've already said um, and some of us may be sitting in one or or other of those um, and and that will determine how we are sitting with people who are suffering because that can actually color our interactions with them. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. Because if, if, if my belief about suffering is that it's because of a curse, that's how I'm going to look at suffering. Mm-hmm. But if I'm then the person who is in the, uh, 
uh, uh, professional capacity and trying to offer something to somebody else who is suffering, that can then color that interaction. So there is a maybe for, for, for maybe this is a question for self-reflection to, to kind of like think about how you self-care, how you put yourself in a position of being able to sit with other people suffering. <laughs> I couldn't agree with you more because it speaks to that counter-transferential experience as well. If we don't know how we feel about it, right? Mm, yeah. We may not be bracketing it as we bring it into the relationship because our really our patients, we are in relationship with them. Polo, mm -hmm. did you want to um I'm sorry if that's I, I thought I saw you jump in. Um, um, can I say something in one minute, maybe, um, you, you, we don't have to answer it. I think I just threw an idea before we move on to the next session. Um, I think um, I just wanted to highlight something that is happening also um, in Lesotho, whereby you find that uh, because of all the uh, religious um, inclinations, sometimes, uh, oh, can we just um, mute our mics, please? Dr. Lizzie. Yes, thank, thank you, you ma'am. And um, you'll find that sometimes when somebody is diagnosed with cancer and uh, more often uh, maybe they've got issues uh, with uh, uh, anemia and uh, they need some blood transfusion. Some of the people, because of their religious inclinations, uh, they will say, oh, I, I cannot have a blood transfusion. Mm -hmm. Maybe that time somebody is only at stage two or stage three and uh, they are still having good uh, possibilities of going through chemo and uh, radiotherapy. And then they refuse the, the, the blood transfusion and they are unwell and unhealthy to go through the, the procedure. So then they are still waiting to take a, um, iron tablets and uh, folic acids and continue with the eating spinach and everything else that is recommended. Then it takes longer for their HP to, to really improve. Then by the time they acknowledge that they are really becoming weaker and weaker, and that they are more open to uh, uh, take on uh, the blood transfusion because they can see their health is really compromised and they have thought about uh, what the possibilities are now that they are getting worse. Then they make a decision to take the blood transfusion. Then all other tests are done and uh, the cancer has advanced to stage four. And everything else that on the, on, in their body, the systems are declining and no longer fit to go through chemo or radiotherapy. Then they become so uh, spiritually traumatized that uh, they even um, wish to abandon their, their whole religious belief. They feel so guilty. They feel so um, sad that uh, they, they were made to believe that blood transfusion is the wrong thing to go for. And, that, and now the, even the same religion they were you know, following, um, they were praying and fasting and doing whatever, and uh, they have not been able to, to be relieved of it. So I think that is when it brings uh, sitting in the suffering with them. By acknowledging what is important to them, listening to them, even silence is still a language that is communicating mm -hmm. from soul mm -hmm. to soul and yeah, inviting point. all those uh, pastoral and uh, chaplains uh, to really be part of their journey uh, so that uh, that level of guilt, bitterness and anger can be dealt with like you have shown in one of the slides, the, the grief model. So I think uh, that is why as Lesotho, we need to pay attention to all all that needs to be done in order to answer the issues of our patients and help us as well to go through the journey because the chaplain services will not in only even be for the patients. We can have our own chaplains Absolutely. or pastoral support mm -hmm. through our, all those uh, self-care uh, models. When we need somebody to step in and stand with us, that is uh, the provision we need to create. So it is a journey in Lesotho and I'm, I'm glad we are all here so that we can all have a, a think about of how best we can move in our own individual individual um, ways of advocating and uh, trying to change policies within the, the area of work we are in. And again, I think with uh, regards to our participants not being active in this kind of sessions, we have to appreciate that uh, because of uh, Lesotho uh, culturally, we don't really um, 
address and confront challenges or things from the as, uh, emotional and spiritual elements. Uh, just like uh, we mentioned the previous, in the previous sessions that uh, even counseling, it's not something that is appreciated. It's like uh, it's because you are a weak person to be going for counseling mm -hmm. or you want to Master. share the family issues with uh, the outsiders or, you know, it's not something the that- stigma is stigmas are still associated yeah. with it, yeah. So it means when we discuss these things that are emotionally provoking, we are actually going through our own personal journeys before we think about mm -hmm. patients. So that's why it is more of the reflective, like uh, you have mentioned and um, yeah. uh, Sister Harriet has said. So by uh, with that, I, I think I can just keep quiet. Mm. Well, thank you so oh, much yeah. for everyone. I think we're we're going to transition now. I appreciate your time and attention. And I will say to Bello has hit the hit the nail on the head for me. Chaplains need chaplains too. You know, all of us need <laughs> that whole uh, network of one another. So uh, it is part of my own personal mission to make sure that we're all attending to our spiritual care and um and know that it's at the forefront and something that uh it, it will make us better clinicians going forward if we're attuned to that so thank you yeah. all right okay. Esther. okay so if um professor hanika brits is ready um we'll just welcome her for the case presentation um i've seen that joan has put the title of a book about suffering in the chat um i think also, Tabella just talking about, you know, our own self-reflection, what we believe about suffering and how we can sit with suffering. Um, is Professor Hanika there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Jumela? I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Lebitsa laki Hanika, haki buasa sutu handli, ke buasa sutu hanyani. And therefore, I will start to speak in English. I can also not speak English that well, but I'm going to try my best. <laughs> I'm a family physician working at the University of the Free State. I'm involved in the Sun, at Sunflower Children's Hospice for many years. I started to work in Sunflower Children's Hospice in 2000. I'm the medical director there. But at the moment, my main... Um, area of expertise is assessment and training. So I'm going to try and assist and give a case presentation. Um, I just want to say that um, I'm going to make a few statements and it is not true for everybody in Lesotho. The one thing is that men are usually the head of the households and therefore it's important when we need, when we ask the females and we speak to the females and we ask them and inform them. Most of the time they would like to go home and discuss it with the males and the family. So the family is very important and it's not a one-to-one -one presentation or one-to-one -one counseling that we do. We need to take into consideration that the males are most of the time um, a very important part. And the second thing is that Although the majority of people in Lesotho are Christian, they also have a belief in ancestors. And if they are very modern, they don't necessarily believe in the ancestors, but they still respect that and they respect the people that work with the ancestors. So they believe that there's a cause and the effect. So everything, good or bad, is because something that somebody did before. And we need to take that into consideration when we look at the total management of all our patients. So therefore I would like to start. Um, so our patient is Mr. M, he's a 40 year old male. He's an inpatient in the hospital as he needs some oxygen. He's having a rifampicin sensitive pulmonary tuberculosis with severe lung, lung damage and severe pain in his legs. He's HIV positive, stage four, had kidney problems. His CD4 count is very low. He presented with severe weight loss, poor sleep, a depressed mood, and a fear for dying because he saw his mother and his brother die in distress previously. And, and the paper used also instruments to measure. Can I get the next slide, please?
Sabella, okay. Okay, so um, this is just a genogram of the um, patient. The patient is that person there in the more or less in the middle with the um, double, um, circ uh, double um, um, square. So this is our patient. He's, he was born in 1983, therefore he's 40 years old currently. He's HIV positive. He's married. His wife is also HIV positive. They had two children. The first one died at the age of two years old because of diarrhea. The second one, daughter is 10 years old. In his family, his father died of HIV and TB. His mother died of HIV and TB, as well as his brother died in the same year. Then he was the second born. He's having a healthy sister. And his younger brother also died in an accident. So as you can see on this slide, that there are lots of people, lots of suffering already in this family, many people that died. And he witnessed the death of his mother and his brother with HIV. And therefore, he was very scared. Can I get the next slide, please? So this is an echo map. So Mr. M and his family, they are there in the middle. So we need to assess different aspects. So if we look at education, he only had grade nine and his daughter is currently in grade five. So there's a, he would like his daughter to attend school so that she can get a better work than him. He was a, he was a laborer. He lost his work during his illness and therefore they've got financial problems. His health facility is about five kilometers from home. Currently, he cannot walk from home to the hospital or to the health facility because of the pain in his legs and his severe shortness of breath. His religion is a Christian, but also have traditional beliefs. And his father's sister is a traditional healer. And then for recreation, they watch soccer and they drink traditional beer and for support from the family and friends, they, they don't have real friends. Some family may visit sometimes, but they don't have a lot of friends or support system from that side. Can I get the next slide, please? So this is almost the same picture that you saw the circles of the um, total pain. So if we look at these um, quality of life, his physical well-being and symptoms. His functional ability was de um, declined, strength and fatigue. He could not sleep well. He lost some appetite. If we look at psychological aspects, yeah, depression, pain, distress, fear for dying. When we look at the social things, he's actually the caregiver of the family, but now we cannot do that. He, there was, there's a lot of distress in the family. His appearance, because he lost a lot of weight, they don't have, they struggle with finances. And then spiritually, he's suffering, the meaning of the pain, his religious, everything is affected by his disease. So it's not only in, even if it is a physical disease, there's a lot of things that we need to look when we, address the patient. Can I get the next slide, please? So how should we manage this patient? The TB and HIV, we're not going to cover today. So we need to treat that with the correct medication. Then we should counsel the patient on his condition, compliance, prognosis. As I said previously, um, Although he may understand what the problem is, he may also have the belief that he or somebody in his family did something wrong because many people in his family now died because of HIV. So there may be an underlying belief that somebody did something wrong and that they need to go to the traditional healer and sort that out. Also the prognosis, if with a CD4 count of 20, his prognosis is not good. Then his emotional well-being. I usually ask the people to tell me in one word how they feel. Do they feel? Because if you ask them how they feel, they start with a lot of things that 
So if you ask them to think clearly, say one word, do you feel sad, hopeless, tired, then we can start to work with that specific um, emotion. And then the multidisciplinary approach, very, very important. And I know that you don't have all these people on your team that we would like on our teams. We would like, everybody would like a social worker, a dietitian, a physiotherapist, a psychologist, a priest, a doctor, a nurse, but we don't have them. So we need to look at the previous slide and see what we need and how can we, if we assist with that specific area or ask somebody else that can assist. And we don't always need very highly trained people to come and assist us. People with basic skills can also assist in many of the things. Then we spoke in the previous presentation about the spiritual um, assessment of hope. We find, need to find out the sources of hope. If they are part of an organized religion, the spiritual practices and the effect on medication. And specifically the practices, what effect will that have on the medication? Can I get the next slide, please? So I just want to say one slide on the management of depression. We need to tell the patient about depression. So the first thing is we need to ask them, how do they feel? If they feel very tired, that is the thing that we need to address. Even if we're going to address many other things, we need to give a medication for the tiredness. Or if they feel very sad, that is the, their main complaint. It may not be our main problem, but it is the patient's main complaint and we need to try and address the main complaint. And then medication. In our specific patient, the patient was feeling depressed. He could not sleep and he had severe pain in his legs. So I know for many patients, we use medication <laughs> like prazit. So we would like in this specific case to use something like a tricyclic <laughs> antidepressant and not necessarily something like um, my SSRI because we can use all the side effects of the medication. So we can use the... Um, mood medicate. So the um, tricyclic antidepressants will be very good to stabilize the mood. It will help the patient to sleep better. And it is a very good drug to use for leg pain, especially patients with HIV and tuberculosis. The other problem that the patients with um, HIV is the chronic diarrhea and the medication is also helping for that. So although we've got side effects of drugs, it's sometimes important that we can use the side effects to our benefit. Can I get the next slide, please? So my questions for discussion is, Mr. M would like to visit a traditional healer as he believes that his condition is caused by bad spirits. How will you approach this? If we can have some discussion on that. So again, put up your hand or type in the chat, but you can also put your hand up and um, we can un un unmute yourself. Does anybody have experience with a situation like this? I think we said that this is how they often, people often view illness. Maybe I can just share some of the experiences that we've got is that I always tell the students, don't try to force somebody that's going to die or try to convert them to your because you're not in their footsteps. So if that is very important for them, I think we need to allow them to do that if it is not dangerous. Mm -hmm. You may not totally agree with that. So we can give some guidelines to tell them that they should not necessarily take some herbs or get some enemas, 
but they can talk to the um, traditional healers and we're open, they can come back immediately when they want to come back. I think that is the one important thing, not to tell them, this is not good for you, I don't believe to do that because we're not in their shoes. This is not our mm -hmm. belief, that is their beliefs. Hello, can I say something? Yes, please, Bernard. Yes, thank you so much, team. Um, I think my input will be based on the experience that I have uh, come across, whereby um, in my village, there was um, a guy who was HIV positive and he was offered um, counseling uh, and um, being told to adhere to medication. Um, however, due to his uh, religious beliefs, uh, his pastor, pastor insisted that uh, he should abandon the medication and uh, focus only on the prayer. So he ended up not using the medication and focusing on the prayer but his health uh, continuously deteriorated. We tried to talk to him, to intervene, to show him the importance of taking the medication. But because he believed so much on uh, the, the pastor, he ended up uh, not using the medication so much that after some time, uh, he got worse and ultimately died. So I think in response, yes, we have to offer the counseling, try to show him the importance uh, of uh, using the medication. However, also respecting uh, his right or his belief. But uh, obviously we have to uh, also do as much as we can to show him the importance of taking the, the medication or the best treatment that we see fit for him. Thank you. Wonderful. Hello. Um, I think Ndate has set uh, such a um, wonderful um, example of uh, most of what uh, the patients uh, in our culture do um, really say in terms of for when they are um, to accept the long-term medication programs. They tend to really either switch um, completely towards uh, the, their uh, religious beliefs or traditional uh, beliefs, uh, in which case some of them, they then become non-compliant with the modern medicine. So I think in addition to what Ndate Bennett has said, we can just see the room to improve our education in terms of uh, the public knowledge that is out there, whether it is um, continuous uh, uh, radio presentations, uh, leaflets, or information centers uh, within ministries that uh, will enable people to have for uh, that gradual understanding that uh, all those kind of dimensions uh, that can help somebody live better are still aligned and uh, one shouldn't really be abandoned to create the room for the other. But uh, uh, that is a long discussion, which uh, uh, I think uh, you have given us uh, such a, a, a good um, statement, uh, Professor Hanek, by saying, we shouldn't force our own religion into other people, but uh, then appreciate and respect uh, their belief systems in as much as we are trying to provide counseling and support. Thank Is you. everybody do still we, there? We... <laughs> Joan, Joan, Joan said she's worked with some traditional, some wonderful traditional healers. I don't know if Joan wants to say something. Yes, we did a, a few years ago, we did quite a push to train traditional healers on palliative care through the National Association. And we found some who are very collaborative um, and really prepared to, to discuss where there could be any 
um, interaction of, of treatments, but they can be quite costly. And this is one of the things that we found that some of them do charge quite a lot to really impoverished patients. Um, but I certainly feel it's a very important group for us to train. Um, if we find that a lot of your patients are going to go to traditional healers and um, we need to respect it. You know, I've, I've had cases where the traditional healers um, treatment of symptoms has been better than, than the medications that we've used, especially for things like bad diarrhea and skin problems. Um, but it's a, it's a matter of being open to communication and respecting, you know, re respecting their professionalism and mm -hmm. respecting the patients and the family's wishes. Mm -hmm. I've just made a quick comment in the chat that this is something that I feel so, um, so uh, impassioned about and especially um, Panika, when you said we we must understand the family dynamics as well, and what the the communication and structure is for medical decision making, and so I appreciate that you you said that and mentioned this. And oftentimes, um, when we were working with traditional healers and or faith leaders, it's um, building in the cost to be practical with with also developing that training and sensitization uh, session is, is important. And it's something that um, whether you can go to them versus them coming to you, being mindful that there is a cost associated with that time and training. And it's um, sometimes opposite. They're not paying to come to you or you're going to pay to go to them. And so it's an important practicality as you're learning and building that network. But um, the traditional healers, I cannot say enough about the, the relationships that have been built in our particular area of, uh, of Malawi. So I know it's possible, I've seen it, um, and very, very, um, very important. Thank you, Joan, for sharing that. Hello. Hello, Hello. everyone. Hi, go ahead. Okay, my name is Matabo from Social Development. I remember a long time, it's not long, that long, when we were still um, a department under the Ministry of uh, Health. Um, we used to engage uh, traditional healers and the spiritual healers in the public health mm -hmm. sector, where we were training together uh, on how best we can help our, our patients. And that seemed to work uh, very well because uh, most of our patients, they seem to believe uh, in their traditional healers more than in our uh, um, Western medicine. So if this is, they are told by their traditional healers and it, it was best um, adhered to than um, when they hear from the professional healthcare workers, so I don't know, I want to know from those who are still in the health sector, if that is still the case, do they still um, include um, traditional healers in the trainings? Thank you. Does anybody have an answer? And I think the people that can better answer uh, uh, our colleagues in Lesotho, but in as far as I remember, the uh, group of our traditional healers with their representative, they were still a part of our uh, Ministry of Health in um, different and relevant uh, arenas. And uh, as Starlight Oasis of Hope Hospice, last year when we were in Lesotho with uh, Dr. Paul, we met uh, 
and uh, somebody that is uh, um, a big figure within the traditional healers um, uh, arena. And uh, we actually propose that uh, at some point when we uh, continue with our uh, progression of our training, we will include the traditional healers because uh, our people in Lesotho, they believe so much in them, even before they show up uh, at the clinic uh, with a fungating wound that is suspicious of being a cancer as wound. They will have consulted a traditional healers 100 times before they show up at, at your door. So we know how much uh, in our culture they believe and trusted traditional healers. And if they are well informed of uh, what are the possible things that might be suggestive of cancer or things that uh, people might need to, to get in touch with the modern medicine, then there will be a better uh, point uh, of our contacts uh, for them to refer them to us in as much as uh, they will still be taking whatever concoctions that they will have uh, recommended for them. So I think it's just to acknowledge and appreciate them. Like Majon said, it's just to respect their professionalism too. Thank you. We have just a few more minutes before we need to um, close up our meeting. And I'm just wondering if anybody has any other questions or comments that they would like to share. I think we've been reminded that um, it's a re there's a lot of things that maybe each one of us needs to reflect upon um, in our own life, what we believe about suffering and how to sit with people. I was also just wondering about, um, I think sometimes we may think that um, only chaplains or spiritual leaders can help people when they're having spiritual distress, but I think it's possible to um, train volunteers who can sit with people um, and be compassionate in that silence. Thank you for saying that, Esther. That is absolutely what I hope to convey, that we can do this and you don't have to be a pastoral counselor or a chaplain. Mm -hmm. but there are skills that we can all share and affirming the dignity of everyone is just right at that core. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have a quick question uh, to Bello. I sent it to you. Is there a national association yet in Musutu for palliative care? Uh, we are in the process of uh, um, trying to register one. We have already established it, the, um, uh, the initial steps uh, with uh, the law office because we certainly acknowledge that we need one. And uh, hopefully by the end of uh, this uh, uh, two batches, we will have uh, completed that and we can really invite um, our participants uh, uh, who might be willing to be part of that uh, changed journey to really get involved and get in touch with us and express their interest. Because uh, we believe uh, unifying uh, the common goal and a common agenda for Lesotho would be the best. So that is why as Starlight, we acknowledge the, the need for um, registration of uh, the Palliative and Hospice uh, Association for the, for the country. But uh, one thing that I wanted to say just before I am, um, uh, just uh, to acknowledge uh, one um, slide uh, that um, came through your, the presentations, which was talking about uh, dignity therapy. And I it, that is certainly so, especially when you look at uh, the people that are vulnerable, that are being taken care by the Ministry of Health, as well as the social development, whether they are people who are disabled, people who have got a learning disabilities, uh, those that have got a dementia, elderly and vulnerable, so that uh, we have got an idea of uh, their uh, preferences, their choices, and uh, what they will really look like. Like uh, one statement that you uh, or Sister Harriet said was talking about, uh, who uh, are you? 
and uh, really trying to understand uh, what is their priority and uh, what uh, they would like to, 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 how they would like to be treated. So here where I work, we have got a document that is called All About Me. And it covers uh, from A to Z of somebody preferences that in a case whereby they are no longer able to say um, what they want and how they want it to be treated and all that. So it can advocate for them, even when maybe the family members are now feeling very vulnerable to represent them because of, of their emotional attachment to such patient and they are traumatized uh, themselves. And instead of communicating on behalf of the patient, they are just uh, uh, you, you know emotional and tearful. But uh, that document can say a lot. So we can be working with um, uh, social development uh, to help them develop uh, that uh, document as well as uh, within the Ministry of Health so that uh, it can be another tool that can help uh, our patients or even help us to take care of our patients uh, in a more comprehensive way. Okay, thank you, Tabello. So Hello. it's um, it's 2.30. Two I think um, we're gonna put the, the slide presentation in there and we can continue to have some discussion in the WhatsApp group. Um, because we're, we're all checking that and we can encourage each other with what we're learning. And next week we'll be having children's palliative care with um, Julia Downing is gonna be the guest lecturer and Jan Duplessis. So I don't know, Tabella, if you wanna make, a, say a few more things just before we say goodbye or is it okay to say goodbye? And thank you thank so you. much for the presentation and the case study, I learned a lot. Um, it's very important. And um, yeah, thank you so, so much for your great